Okay, so we're going to go on now to something that was very, uh, a very clever experiment was done here. And this experiment was done in the, uh, 1999. It was published in the year 2000, so it's only a decade old. A little more than a decade old. Uh, Kim Kulik, Yu, Shi, and Scully did this. And it's called a delayed choice quantum erasure. And it solves all the problems that uh, any of the ph that physicists had with the original double slit experiment. And I'm going to read you a little bit about it. Here's a one sentence. I won't read you more than one sentence from this uh, physics paper. Uh, it said, in the, in the two-slit experiment, the common wisdom, and wisdom is in quotes, the common wisdom is that the position momentum of uncertainty relation makes it impossible to determine which slit the photon or electron passes through without at the same time disturbing the photon or electron enough to destroy the interference pattern. However, it's been proved that this common interpretation is not true. Now, that's just what I was telling you. What he was saying is common wisdom that there's interference up here at this slit because you have energy touching it. They also believe that there was, there was uh, in erasure experiments, there's always the, the experiment touched the experiment. You know, you always had to affect it some way to get the answer. Well, this is a, a very brilliant experiment that erases all those things. Here's the light coming through the slit. And what it does is it hits a, a particular kind of material here that immediately creates a doublet. Two photons get created. So the original photon comes through, stops right there, and creates a pair, an entangled pair of photons. And these are called the signal, the ones that go up here. Hit, this one goes up there. That's called the signal photon. And the ones that come down here are called the idler. And they just made those names up. They don't mean anything in particular. So there is no you see, there is no uh, measurement here as far as having to measure which hole it went through, which, which of those two holes. is because if it went through this one, this second photon comes down here and will go into this detector or will come down here and go into this detector or that detector. I'll explain that in just a minute. And the same here. So we're looking at this pair, this entangled pair, and the, the idler of the pair will tell us which slit it went through. We don't have to touch it with anything. And the signal pair that come up here, that's where our interaction goes. So this detector is like this screen. Okay, here's our double slits, really these two, and here's our screen. So we get through this slit, comes up here, this slit comes up here. So the probability comes here. Probability goes through both these slits. Probability, there's certain probability that it's gonna end up in this detector, certain probability that it's going to end up in detector one, two, three, or four. Now here's what happens. If it comes through here, this idler photon hits a prism that bends it. This little thing is a, is, this is a, uh, a mirror, a half-silvered mirror. It's a beam splitter. It's the BS. That's the BS, right? And that means that there's a 50-50 chance that it'll bounce here up into detector four or it'll go through and hit this mirror, which will come down here and hit another beam splitter, which 50-50, it'll either be reflected here or it'll be transmitted there. So what you need to know is that this idler can come here, hits this beam splitter, can end up in three, or it can go here, bounce there, or go straight. So if it goes here, then you know it went through the bottom slit. If we get, a, if we get something in this detector, four, we know it went through the upper slit, right? If we get a detection in three, we know it went through the bottom slit. And if it doesn't reflect into three, it'll go here, and then it has a 50-50 chance of whether it goes through this beam splitter and goes to this detector or bounces off of that beam splitter and goes to this detector. So over here, we don't know which slit it goes through. So we can get a detection in one or two, 50-50, no matter which one of these paths it goes, no matter which slit it goes through, that's the eraser. You see, the, the, the information of which slit the, the electron or the photon goes through is erased here in 
one and two, because it's a 50-50 chance that either one of them would end up in one or two, no matter which path it takes. Okay, so uh, there's, there's no touching this experiment. There's no, nothing we do. It's all just up to quantum mechanics to do whatever it wants to do. It's a very elegant experiment. And what happened was that every time a particle gets thrown at this thing, you'll always get one detection here because it either goes through this slit or this slit. In either case, something goes to that detector. That's the same as our screen. Here, you throw in a particle, you'll always get a dot one of these places or you'll get a dot here or here. One particle in, one particle out. Now, because, we're just, because reality is statistical, there is a 50-50 chance that we'll go to three or four, go through one split or the other, or we'll go to one and two where we erase the information. It's 25% chance it'll go to four, 25 to three, 25% chance to one, 25% chance to two. But four and three shows which slit it goes through. One and two says, we don't know. So we've erased the information. Okay, so that's, what, that's how this experiment um, was done. Okay, the other, the other uh, little sentence I'll read from this paper says that the results are all consistent with prediction. That means this double slit experiment's got exactly the same results as any other double slit experiment that has ever been done since the early 1920s. No difference. It comes out the same way. Okay, now how does that, uh, how does that come out? Well, whenever a, whenever a particle Whenever a, uh, a particle uh, got into either detector three or four, remember that's the one that, that said what slit it went through, you get this, okay? You get the, which is basically this pattern. Well, this is just for one of them. This, this was for the R3. So you get one spot here, and what they said in the paper was that the spot you got here and the spot you got here were basically identical. They were just shifted a little bit from each other, so they just give you this one picture. So all the output lumps up in one spot. And where you erase the data, you get this picture, which is the diffraction pattern. Right? This, is their, this is their data. Okay, the, uh, the thing that's interesting here, and let me go back. I think I can go back, can I not? No, I went back twice. Okay, what's interesting here is that this is the shortest path. That's shorter than here to here to here. So the diffraction pattern or the lumped pattern, either one of these patterns, is already done. It's already been detected. It's over. The results have been sent off to the computer before the idler ever gets to this choice, before it gets split. So we've already collected the data. That's done. Now later, afterwards, we'll decide which slit it went through, you see? So that's the interest, that's what's going on. So what happens later, after the, de after the data's been detected, is what determines whether you get this pattern or this pattern. That's why it's a delayed choice eraser. So you collect the data, then sometimes later, you decide which slit it went through, and depending on whether it went through this slit or that slit, you get one pattern, and if you don't have the information, you measure it, but then you erase it, then you get the diffraction pattern. And both of those choices happened after you already collected the data. All right, so um, that's the experiment, and that's the data. So let me... Uh, I know that's confusing. You're not used to looking at things out of physics papers. But I'm going to make this simpler. I'm going to redo it now in, in the terms that we've already discussed about so that you get the idea of what's going on, what this says. Now, what does this scientific experiment say about reality? Um, okay. Uh, let's say that they are, and here's that, here's that experiment here, but I'm, gonna, I'm going to... Uh, explain it with the, the one that you're more used to that's easier. Let's say we have two physicists, physicist A and physicist B, 
and they, they work together and they do this experiment where they measure the data, they record the data that each slit, the data that says what particle went through which slit, and they record this data, which is the output data. This is what we call the screen, you know, and these are the slits. So they record all the data, and what they're going to get, of course, is two spots, because that's the experiment that they do. And they're going to do this experiment 102 times. Just do it and do it again, collect the data, collect it again. I could change anything. Just going to repeat the experiment, collect the data 102 times. Okay? Now, what they're going to do is every time they do an experiment, they're going to take this data, which is the detector data, put it in an envelope, say experiment one. Take this data, put it in an envelope. Take this data, put it in an envelope. They're not going to look at either one. They're just going to take the data, stick it in envelopes, take these two envelopes, these two pieces of data that go together for experiment one, put them in a bigger envelope, call that envelope experiment one. Okay? So now they're going to do experiment two. They're going to take this detection data, put it in an envelope, take this result, put it in an envelope, put those in a bigger envelope called experiment two, and so on, through all 102. Okay, now when they're done that, they're going to have 102 envelopes. And they want to make sure that there's something, nothing happened in between. So they look at experiment number one, they open up the envelopes, and they look at this data, and they look at that data, and sure enough, this is exactly what they see. They see two spots. And they take number 102, and they open it up, and they look at the data, they look at this, and they look at that, and this is exactly what they see, two spots. Okay? So they have a pretty good idea now that nothing happened in between. The first and the last are exactly as expected. Okay, now they're going to take these envelopes, they're going to lock them in a, in a fireproof safe. We've got 100 left, right? Number 2 through number 101. And they're going to lock all those envelopes in a safe, fireproof safe someplace. They're going to wait a year. At the end of the year, they're going to, come, they're going to take the envelopes out and they're going to shuffle them randomly, put them in two piles of 50 each. They have two piles of 50 each of these things that are year old. The experiment's been done. Now what happens is that, let's take pile number one. Pile number one, you open up both envelopes that go with each experiment, and all 50 of them have two spots of light right here, exactly what they would expect. Now we'll take the other 50. And what you do with the other 50 is you pull out all the detector data, all the envelopes that have detector data, and you burn them. Detector data is gone. It's been erased. Now you open up all. Now you open up the envelopes that have this data, and you get a diffraction pattern. Okay. Those 50 all have a diffraction pattern. Why? Because the information of what slit they went through doesn't exist anymore. See, it's all about information. Now this, this is just a, this is a, what we would call a, uh, a logical analog of what I just showed you, that experiment. This is a delayed quantum erasure, just like we talked about. Okay. That's what's going, that's what was going on. So the data was detected here in this experiment. It all got detected and then sometime later, somebody decided what, whether it went through this slit and that detector or that slit and that detector. And if they had that information, they got this pattern. Or if after this data was already done, they erased that information here, you got this pattern. So I've just said it to you in a different way. All right, so let's, let's change it a little bit. Let's say that uh, A and B do this. They take all the same data the same way, right? Except B, the day before the year's up and they're gonna, and they're gonna you know, have the newsmen come and they're gonna sort the piles into two groups of 50 or whatever, B sneaks into the safe, opens it up, and uh, takes a movie, sets up a movie camera, okay? He looks at all the data, opens all the envelopes for each experiment, looks at the, looks at the data, looks at the results, puts them all back in the envelopes so nobody can know that they were touched, puts them back in the safe. Okay, what happens? Well, when the day comes the next day, they do the same thing, you see? And what happens? Well, what happens is that all 100 of them are like this, because the data is here in this reality. So you see, because it's already been looked at and it's on this movie thing, you know, the data's here. 
we can't have a conflict in the data. Okay, now let's, let's just say that uh, we'll go back to the beginning again. This time, let's say that, that uh, B makes the movie, uh, looks at all the data, returns the originals to the safe, a fire breaks out, destroys the camera, all the data's gone. Okay, so now we had a movie of it, just like we did the, the second time, except now that the movie uh, gets destroyed. What happens? Well, the same as before, right? The same as the very first time we did it. Half of them are like this, and the other half are like that. Half of them show diffraction patterns. All right, now let's, let's do another one. Let's say it didn't make a movie. Let's say B sneaks into it, looks at all of them, takes a picture with the camera of all the data, takes a picture of this, you know, opens up experiment number two, looks at it, takes this picture, takes this picture, and has all the pictures, and the pictures aren't labeled. And let's say B walks out of the, walks out of the building and uh, you know, gets hit by a car and all the pictures go everywhere and they all get scattered. Okay. And then the next day when A goes out and does his shuffle and whatever, what happens? Half of them are like this and half of them are like that because even though there's pictures of them laying around, they're not labeled. It just looks like one picture or it looks like uh, 100 pictures of the same thing. There's no way to tell which is which. So there's no data. And then finally, let's say that, the, that the B makes the movie, goes out and gets run over, but the camera survives. Camera still, the data is still in that camera, can still be extracted from that camera somehow. And of course, what would happen is that all of them would have to be like this because the data is now here in this reality frame and it's available. You see, the problem is we can't have an inconsistency in our reality. We can't have data showing that you had a particle here and not have a particle go in a straight line and make a point there. See, so it's about information and consistency. Okay, so that's, that's kind of a simpler example. So whether you measure which slit it goes through, physicists call that the which way information. In other words, which slit did it go through? It's called the which way information. Um, so note in this experiment, and in the above example I just gave, the which way measurement and erasure were made after the signal quantum had been detected, or in other words, after these experiments were all done. Okay. When the which way information was erased, the result could be defined differently because the result was still in the future. So you hadn't looked at the data yet. It was indeterminate because nobody had looked at it yet. What it looked like was not yet a fact, not yet part of our physical reality historical record. There is no factual contradiction created. Now, objective causality was violated but that's not a contradiction since objective causality is just an erroneous belief. <laughs> not a fact. The fact is that reality is probabilistic and statistical and only approximately objective where there is little uncertainty. Tiny fast particles have much uncertainty, but so do lots of other things at the macro level. Okay. Though it is true that only consciousness can make a measurement and that a measurement is required, it is the fact of recording the data and making the data become available as part of the historical record in this reality frame that collapses the wave function. The only two rules are don't contradict the rule set or historical consistency. Okay, so that's in a nutshell what this, what this experiment says. Reality is not the way you see it. Now you can see why a lot of physicists kind of deny this, right? It's like denying that the world is flat because it doesn't make sense. Well, what I've just showed you, if you believe in an objective reality, doesn't make sense. It can't happen. Right? It just can't happen. But it does. 
Okay, now let's, let's look a little bit of, take a back up and do a little perspective of what's going on here. I'm going to give you some, some quotes of the people who lived at that time and did this work. And uh, these are from uh, Albert Einstein. Okay, if we think of the field as being removed, now here this is his unified field for what his, his toe was unified field theory. There is no space which remains since space does not have an independent existence. Reality is merely an illusion. It's clear that the space of physics is not in the last analysis anything given in nature or independent of human thought. It is a function of our conceptual scheme. Right? Space is a function of our conceptual scheme. That doesn't sound like objective uh, you know, reality at all. It sounds like mind is creating space. And here's one, uh, one of my favorites. This was uh, in a letter from Einstein to Bohm, one of his uh, co-workers. One has to find a possibility to avoid the continuum together with space and time altogether, but I have not the slightest idea what kind of elementary concepts could be used in such a theory. Okay, so they've seen, they've done the experiment. They've done it over and over again. The experiment's not wrong. Reality is not objective. We need a new model, but I haven't the slightest idea what kind of elementary concepts could be used in such a theory. You see, and we haven't moved one step past that yet today. We still are in that same spot. All right. Now here's a quote from uh, Eugene Wigner. He was also, all the people I'm quoting here are all Nobel Prize winners. These were all top guys in their field. Um, it will remain remarkable in whatever way our future concepts may develop that the very study of the external world led to the scientific conclusion that the content of consciousness is the ultimate universal reality. See, does that sound like metaphysics or physics? See, this is a Nobel Prize winning physicist telling about the way reality is. Max Planck. Science cannot solve the ultimate mystery of nature because in the last analysis, we ourselves are part of the mystery we're trying to solve. In other words, he's saying that, you know, what's out there is entangled with what's in here. It has to do with consciousness. Okay, so now all these quotes were made back in the 1920s, 1930s, right? This is the early, you know, the first half of the, of the 1900s is where these quotes come from. All right. Now, here's some from Werner Heisenberg. He says, the only thing that can accurately describe an elementary particle is a probability function that in itself contains nothing about the quality of being or the physical existence of that particle. Niels Bohr, the common sense view of the world in terms of objects that really exist out here, out there, independently of our observations, totally collapses. In the face of the quantum factor, he meant in the face of this new science called quantum mechanics. Niels Bohr, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. And then Niels Bohr, uh, one more where he's, just like what Einstein said, he, he points to where the solution has to be. He says, every great deep difficulty bears in itself its own solution. It forces us to change our thinking in order to find it. Okay, again, all Nobel Prize winners. So here, that's the solution. Einstein says, no problem can be solved from the same level of thinking that created it. Well, what's that mean? It means if you can't find a solution, if it doesn't make sense, you need a different paradigm. You need to change you know, your, con your concept of the nature of reality. And Bohr, you know, every great and deep difficulty bears itself its own solution. It forces us to change our thinking in order to find it. It forces us to find a new paradigm upon which to base our concepts of reality. Okay, so they knew that objective causality was dead. They knew that a whole new paradigm was needed. But then we have the quote I read of Einstein. One has to find a possibility to avoid the continuum. Continuous functions didn't work. It needed to be digital altogether. But I've not the slightest idea what elementary concepts to use, you see. So they knew that they needed a whole new paradigm, but the new paradigm they needed was out of their reach. They didn't know how to step away from objective causality. They did know they would have to step away from it, but they didn't know how. 
Okay, digital science, digital computers, virtual reality concepts didn't exist at that time. Okay? It was not an idea that existed then. Its time was not yet there. All right, so that's quantum mechanics then. If you notice these people, you know, the Heisenberg, Bohr, uh, Wigner, all these people, they're making these statements that sound like metaphysics because that's what, the, that's what it was saying. Now let's look at quantum mechanics today. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about Richard Feynman, and those of you who aren't physicists probably don't know Richard Feynman, but Richard Feynman is one of the best, and he is a quantum theorist. Okay. And that was his thing, was quantum theory, and he was very knowledgeable. He was very, uh, very good at it, a brilliant man, also a Nobel Prize winner. But now this is going to, his quotes are going to tell us the modern day. We've just, we've just read the quotes back from when this was done in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Here's the quotes from a contemporary scientist and I'd say one of the best quantum theorists that the world has seen in the last you know, 20 years. Okay, a quote from Richard Feynman. The double slit experiment contains the basic mystery of the quantum mechanics. That's true. The next quote says, shut up and calculate. Now that was a quote, it was a famous quote of, of Richard Feynman's. These aren't obscure quotes, you can find these on the internet. That was a very famous quote from, from Richard Feynman and it was a quote to his graduate students. And his graduate students would say, Dr. Feynman, what's going on here? You know, why, is it, why has it worked this way? This is really very strange. And Dr. Feynman said, shut up and calculate. It reminds me that, that that uh, this fundamentalist we talked about who think the, the universe couldn't be more than 7,000 years. You know, you can imagine a, a, young, a, a young student coming into the, to the uh, good reverend or whoever and saying, but sir, you know, dinosaurs have radio, you know, for millions of years old, radioactive decay can tell us that. And the, the, and the reverend looks at him and says, shut up and pray. You know, it's the same thing. Fundamentalism is fundamentalism, no matter where you find it. Um, okay, belief trap is the problem. We're stuck in this paradigm of an objective causality. Why? What's the big problem? Why all the denial? Well, physicists have given up trying to find a new paradigm, a new, a new paradigm. They now believe that it's impossible to explain, that nobody can understand it. So look at these other quotes. Um, Richard Feynman, the best quantum theorist, says, I don't understand quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics represents a phenomenon that is impossible to explain in any classical way. Well, what's a classical way? That means in terms of objective reality. Uh, I, I, put these quotes together when I went to Calgary, so uh, that was in Canada, so I, I picked this, this quote out from David Harrison, Department of Physics, but I'm not picking on any of these people. I could find somebody in every university on this planet who would make these same quotes. This is what is, this is, what is standard wisdom. This is common wisdom now among physics departments today. And that is, just like, uh, just like Feynman said, he says, it may be true that nobody can understand quantum mechanics in the usual meaning of the word, understand. And what that means is in terms of objective causality. So what happened before, when these experiments were new, people were saying, this is amazing. Obviously, reality is not objective. And we need to find a new paradigm. Almost 100 years later, it shut up and calculate. It's impossible. Nobody can know. So you see where we've gone in 100 years? We went from enthusiasm, this is a brave new world, we just have to figure it out. We go to Einstein saying, I can't figure it out, I have no idea where to start, to physicists today saying, it's impossible. It can't be done. Okay, that now gives you the perspective of where we are. Okay. Feynman knew as well as anybody. He knew quantum mechanics as well, if not better than anybody, but he just couldn't bring himself to say, at least not in public anyway, that reality was not objective. That's like telling the preacher that 
the universe is older than 7,000 years. It just violates a very fundamental scientific belief. So instead he said, shut up and calculate, and I don't understand quantum mechanics because he couldn't say reality is not objective. Okay, why? Well, you've all heard of the scientific method, right? That's the crown jewel in you know, Western philosophy that has separated uh, truth from BS you know, for, for 200 years, scientific method. Well, guess what? The scientific method has a, an explicit assumption of an objective reality. So if you let objective reality go, the scientific method doesn't hold anymore. Well, that's a very scary proposition for scientists. Suddenly, their underpinning philosophy of the scientific method doesn't work. Scientific method says anybody can repeat an experiment anywhere at any time, and it always gives you the same results. That is true in an objective reality. So the, object, the scientific method says a double slit experiment can't happen. Well, the fact is, it does happen, you see. That's the problem, it's, and it happens over and over again. Um, you know, the, the, the um, scientific method and, and objective reality would tell you that the placebo effect can't happen. You take a medicine, it's either going to work or not work. That medicine is going to affect with your biology, and you're either going to get better or not based on the medicine. The placebo effect says that if you believe that the pill you're taking is going to help you, you have a pretty good probability of getting better. Well, that shouldn't happen in an objective reality. It shouldn't matter what you think about that pill, whether you think it'll help you or think it'll hurt you. It shouldn't make any difference. Either the pill works or it doesn't. See, and that's not true. Reality doesn't work that way. The placebo effect is such a major effect that that's the only way that a, that a pharmaceutical company can, can market a drug is if they can beat the placebo effect. And that's getting harder and harder to do. They're having more trouble beating the placebo effect. Matter of fact, in order to get their medicines out to market, they're taking their, their research that determines whether or not they can beat the placebo effect to other cultures, other places, mostly third world countries where they're technically less sophisticated. They can go into those cultures and sure enough, their medicine works and it beats the placebo effect. They take it in a, in a Western culture and it doesn't. It's a different mindset, you see. So, anyway, none of those things should happen in an objective reality, but they all do happen. Um, so the scientific method is, is uh, looks like everything, you know, it doesn't work, so it looks like everything goes up in smoke. It's like, um, you know, the scientific method, what, it gave us the industrial age, age of science and technology, the information age, and it's wrong. Everything that scientists believe for the last 200 years goes up in smoke. Well, that's not really true. It doesn't go up in smoke. What scientists fail to perceive and appreciate is that the historical process of undergoing a paradigm shift in the nature of reality usually works like this. When you have a new paradigm, the old paradigm doesn't just go away. It generally is just relegated to a subset. It's, it becomes an approximation. Now here's some examples. We have the flat earth, and then we got the spherical earth. But the flat earth is still a very good approximation over short distances. Matter of fact, all of our surveying unless it's global surveying, all of our surveying is done on a flat earth model. When you go out here and they do surveying for putting a house or a, a building or, or how much acreage you own, that's all done on a flat earth model. Because over short distances of a couple hundred yards or whatever, flat earth is perfectly adequate approximation. Okay, then we had uh, relativity and we had quantum mechanics and they replaced Newtonian mechanics. Well, does that mean we threw out Newtonian physics? No. Probably 95% of all the physics that's done on the planet is Newtonian physics. It's only when you have very special cases that you need relativity and quantum mechanics. Relativity for things that are fast and large and quantum mechanics for things that are 
small. Okay? But we didn't throw away Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics just became an approximation. So where you're dealing with the macro world where it's not too small and where you're dealing with speeds that aren't too fast, Newtonian physics, it's not right, but it's a very, very close approximation. Well, now we're going to take the next step. Okay, and what we're going to find is that this, objective, this assumption of an objective reality and the scientific method is not going to be thrown out like, all oh, right, that, that didn't work, let's get rid of it. It just becomes an approximation. This reality is approximately objective. Wherever the uncertainty of the measurement, wherever the uncertainty of the data is small. Well, where is the uncertainty of the data generally small? It's when you're dealing with physical things. You measure the size of a brick. You measure the weight of a rock. The uncertainty in those measurements is very, very small compared to the thing that you're dealing with. So they seem to be objective. Everybody measures the weight of the rock. Everybody gets approximately the same answer. Okay? Not exactly the same answer, but approximately the same answer. It's not objective. So they can't get exactly the same answer. And here's why. If you, let's say you're measuring a brick. If you measure a brick, and you say, well, that's objective. Bricks are objective. How long is this brick? OK, within the first three or four decimal places, everybody will agree. After that, if you have 100 different groups measuring that brick, you'll get 100 different answers. Why? Because we get down to the smaller and smaller detail. That surface of that brick is not flat. It's got dips. and mounds and holes and it's a very irregular surface. Well, how do you define just where that surface is? Is it out here to the, the biggest dips? Or is it an average between the dips and the peaks of the side of that brick? You see? So we're back to statistics. We're taking averages now. This is not objective. Then we get down to a molecular level and we look at the molecules of the side of that brick and they're going like this. They're all over the place. How are you going to measure the side, that brick when the sides of the brick are doing this all the time? And they're not even doing it together. The various places on the side of that brick, they're all moving around. So what's the, si what's the size of that brick? Well, you see, it's not objective. You can't say. It doesn't have a size. It becomes statistical and probabilistic. So see, our reality is only objective approximately. And that's true of anything. Any measurement we make is only approximately objective. Okay, we know that if you have five people watching an accident, they all see the same accident and they all give different accident reports. All right? Reality is not objective. They all have their own interpretation of what happened. Okay, so relativity and quantum mechanics are on the cusp of, on the cusp of becoming a subset of a larger, greater truth. Subsets of a bigger theory of everything, a more complete and holistic science. Though most physicists are not aware of this fact because it's still very early in the struggle for acceptance. However, it will become accepted because it answers the big questions in both physics and metaphysics. You will soon find out why potential future particles are probability distributions and why C is a constant. Those are the two fundamental truths that underlie quantum mechanics and relativity. How a more complete quantum theory applies to the macro world as well as the micro world and why pair labs, that's Princeton Engineering and Anomalies Research, done a lot of mind matter interaction research at Princeton. They've been doing this for probably 30 years. Um, and other science houses that study mind matter interactions, it'll explain why they get the results that they get. You'll find out how synchronicity works, how the placebo effects works, and how to heal somebody with your mind, as well as who and what you are and what your purpose is. Okay. All right. So, we believe that our reality is objective. We forget that objectivity is only an approximation. The myth of objectivity seems obviously correct 
because we all have similar sensors and we all live in a macro world where constraints are considerable and uncertainties relative to those constraints are small. So we look at the hard sciences versus the soft sciences. In the hard sciences is where we study the stuff, right? The object, the bricks, the things. There, uncertainty is small, so it seems objective. We go to the soft sciences, and what do we find? We're studying things that have lots of uncertainty. We're studying people. We're talking about psychology, economics, sociology, those sorts of things we call soft sciences. Well, there, there's lots of uncertainty because you're dealing with people, and we people are very uncertain in what we do and why we do it. And how does the soft sciences do science if they have all this uncertainty? Double blind, triple blind. Why is it that in the soft sciences, science must be done double blind? Because if you don't do it double blind and triple blind, no two teams doing the same work get the same answers. The answers are all different if you don't do that. Okay, you see, so we've already come to this idea about where there is less uncertainty, it approximates being objective, and where there's more uncertainty, it isn't objective. So we've already kind of learned that, but we don't see the bigger, the bigger picture yet. All right, um, so reality is fundamentally statistical, and at a much more fundamental level than just a measurement error. Okay, a future sun, like everything else, a future brick, a future atom, a future photon, a future statistical analysis, a future dead tree line on the ground exists only in probability and are brought into this reality frame by measurement, taking the data and making it available here. The result of a particular measurement is randomly sampled from a discrete possible states that represent the probable future of that object at an instant. Okay. Now, let me go to the next slide, and I want to... Uh, there we go. I want to explain to you, because you're going to hear me say a lot that, you know, we go into the probability distribution, and we pull out an answer, and then that's what we get. And you'll hear that a lot. I want you to know what that means. Okay, here's a, here's a probability distribution of something happening. Okay, and it's a very steep distribution. What that tells you is that the probability of this thing being in, st in state A, B, C, D, or E is zero, or G, H, I, J, and K is zero. The probability of it being in F is one. Okay, this is something with very little uncertainty. You see, probability is associated with uncertainty. If you have less uncertainty, you have a narrower, a narrower spike. Okay, the way this works is, when I say you take a random sample, um, here's, here's a curve that shows that there's a lot more uncertainty as to what state it could be in. It could be in E, it could be in F, could be in G, it could even be out here in, one, in, in J, but it's less likely. Now, how are we going to take a, a, a sample from this? Well, let's say that you know, here's a probability. That means from here where it's zero up to the top is one, right? Probability always goes from zero to one. But probability is just a ratio. You know, it's a probable. There's a ratio of x to y if something happens. That's probability. So we can multiply all the numbers we have under here by 100, which means that f now instead of one is going to be 100. All right? Now, if that's 100, let's say that uh, over here on E is like 85, and let's say G is like uh, 90, 92, because it falls off a little less on this side than it does on that, and so on. And this is maybe 80, and maybe 60, and maybe you know, 20, and maybe 2, that kind of thing, right? So that'll be what my numbers are. So now if I'm going to, well, let's do it this way. Let's say that this is like a raffle. Let's say I'm going to take 100 Fs and put them in a box. 100 pieces of paper that has F written on it, and I'm going to put that in a box. It's going to be my raffle box, and I'm going to draw one out randomly later. And then I'm going to take, what did I say over here, 85 E's, and maybe 92 G's, and so on. Okay? So I'm going to fill up this box like that, and out here with, with B, maybe that's just 3, and maybe A is 1. So I'm going to fill my box up with all of, with all of that, and I'm going to reach in, and I'm going to grab 1. 
That's taking a random sample. Okay, now what's the probability up here? I'm going to put 100 Fs into a box. And I'm going to reach in and I'm going to grab a random sample and what am I going to get? F, right? That's it. Okay, here I'm going to have a whole lot more of that, right? Matter of fact, if you add all these up, you get about 500 or so. If you, if you add up all these, there's about 500 pieces of paper in the box. Okay. After this slide, we'll have a little break. I'm getting the, the break sign back here in the back. All right, you have 500 pieces of paper in this box. And let's say one of them was an A, because there's only A is one. So then you have one in 500, right? If you reach into the box, that you'll pull out an A. And if there were the 100 Fs, there'll be 100 out of that 500, or about one in five that you'd pull out an F. So that's what I mean when I say you're going to a distribution and you randomly sample what's in that distribution. That's what I'm talking about. Now, we have a, we have a, uh, a thing in, in physics and electronics called tunneling. And it has to do with this probability. I don't know if you've heard of tunneling, but there's tunneling diodes. There's tunnel, it's devices. These are things that are electronic components in your radio and, and uh, in this sound system. They probably have tunneling diodes. What tunneling is, is that if you have, say you have this probability distribution like this, and you put a, a particle, you put a thing. These are electrons. You put an electron in this potential well. That means the electron is trapped there. It can't get out. It doesn't have enough energy to get out of the well. It's stuck. Okay, so let's say we put a bunch of electrons in here. Then if reality was objective, they just have to stay there. It's like marbles in a box. And unless you kick the box or do something to it, the marbles aren't going to roll up the side of the box and roll out, right? They can't do that. They don't have enough energy to get out of the box. Well, what happens with electrons is they're not really electrons, remember? That's just our, you know, that's us making, thinking that our inference from, the, from what we measure is actually a real thing. They're not really electrons, they're probability distributions. And those probability di distributions go from minus infinity to plus infinity. In other words, that electron could be almost anywhere. So they're in this well, and you go into a, you go into a distribution and say, well, here's their big... Here's plus infinity and minus infinity, and we think the electron's here and F in the box. But it could be other places. If you only have a few electrons, let's say the probability that it's outside the box is 1 in 10 million. Just 1 in 10 million that it would be found outside the box. Well, if you have a billion electrons in there, a probability of 1 in 10 million is not a bad bet, right? you got a billion electrons in there. Well, what happens is that we find electrons outside the box. We just look for them, and there they are, outside the box. We put them all in the box. We have detectors outside the box, and there's one, and there's another. They just keep showing up outside the box, and it's impossible because they can't get out of the box. You see, that's called tunneling. So we say they tunnel through the box. That's just physics speak for we don't have a clue what's going on. <laughs> but... We know they get out of the box. And we have incorporated this tunneling into our electronic gadgets. A tunneling diode is a place where you depend on that current, on those electrons getting out of the box, okay, at a certain rate. So this is just another effect where the impossible happens. It happens all the time. It happens so often we actually build components based on it. Okay, it's called tunneling in physics. And all it is is the fact that these electrons aren't really little massy particles with charge. They're just probability distributions. And there's a certain probability that they can do something really strange. And if you have enough of them, strangeness happens all the time. You see? So that's a, just a kind of an example. So in an objective reality, tunneling is impossible. In a virtual reality, based on probability and statistics, it's only unlikely that uh, the world is objective is another belief. Every object and every interaction contains some uncertainty. By the end of the day, we will see that nothing is fixed in this reality until a conscious being makes a measurement that creates information that is available to others within this physical reality, thus forcing the probability distribution to collapse to a physical result. 
Uh, we've talked a lot about quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is based on the, on the understanding that particles are really di uh, um, probability distributions. They're not really particles at all. That uh, we live in a virtual reality and it's based on probability. Okay, then I wanted to turn to, to uh, relativity and show you a little bit how virtual reality answers that question as well. Relativity is based on one fact, really, and that is that the speed of light is constant. Okay, that's, the, that's the big fact there. Once you understand that, that speed of light, which is called C, is a constant, then the rest of it, you can get special relativity with just a little simple algebra once you take that as, a, as an assumption. So C being a constant is today a mystery, just like why are, why are particles probability distributions? It's a big unanswered impossible mystery. Why is C constant is a big impossible you know, mystery to scientists today. You see C is a, just a velocity and everything else that, every, every other velocity that we deal with is additive. And what I mean by that is if you're in a car and the car's going 10 mile an hour and you have a ball and you reach out the window with this ball and you throw it in the forward direction of the car and you throw it another 10 miles an hour, then the ball, at least the instant it leaves your hand, would be going 20 miles an hour, right? It gets 10 miles an hour worth of velocity from the car, 10 miles velocity from what you throw. It's additive. You add them together. And everything we know of, except light, works like that. Light doesn't. If you're traveling in a rocket ship at 90% the speed of light and you reach out your window, instead of throwing a ball, you turn on a flashlight, you don't get anything more than C, same speed of light. And if you're going backward or if you turn, turn your flashlight on in the opposite direction, you get C. No matter what, how fast the flashlight's going, every time you turn it on, the light moves at a velocity, C. It never changes. So it's, it's called invariant under the velocity of the platform. Nothing else in our reality works that way. So it's a big mystery why C should be a constant. And uh, here's why it's a constant. Uh, if, you, if you're going to make a virtual reality, a the first thing you'd have to do in making a virtual reality, say we're going to make Sims, or we're going to make a competitor to the Sims game. First thing we want to know is how much resources are we going to have to fund to support this? How big does a computer have to be? What's the speed of the computations necessary? How fast does a computer have to be? And how large, how much throughput is it going to have to have? Those are the key things in making a, a virtual reality. It's the same with making our virtual reality, and that's why you'll see that C is a constant. So assume that this is space, and this is a little volume of space, and this is another little volume of space, and so on. These are all volumes of spaces. All right, we, we need to look at the resolution, the pixel size, okay, and the frame rate. Those are the, those are the key things. Okay, in, in our 3D reality, one 3D pixel of volume We'll just call that delta V. It's a little quantum of volume. And the frame rate is how often do you update the information, okay? In a simulation, that's what I call delta T. You have a simulation and you run through code and then you increment that delta T by one little increment, which means time now has moved on a little bit, then you run through the code again. And you increment that delta T and you run through the code again. That's how simulations that are dynamic work. You keep implement you keep increasing the T every time you go through the iterative loop. Okay, that's how simulation works. If you have a simulation of a ball being thrown, okay, you calculate where is the ball now? Where is the ball delta T from now? Where's the ball delta T from that? And so on. Every delta T you calculate a new position for that ball. Well here, the delta T is the frame rate. How often do you update this virtual reality? How often do I have to change the data on the screen. Okay, now in, a, in, our, in our computer game, we have our data on a, on a two-dimensional screen. And I have to know how often do I have to update the data and how much data am I going to have. Each pixel on our, on our monitor has an intensity and it has a color. 
That's the data that I have to have. Okay, now here, here's a, pot, here's a pixel of our volume. And if we're going to, if we're going to uh, communicate, we have to pass something from this pixel to that pixel to that pixel. It has to be continuous. The reason it has to be continuous, if you had data and you moved it in one jump from this pixel to that pixel, skipping the other two, that's called teleportation. And things basically jump around in your reality. They don't have to continuously, you don't have to, you know, in order to get to here from here, you have to move through all the spaces in between. You can't just disappear from here and appear here. Okay, so that's why we have to move continuously like that. Okay, what we have is because our reality at rest, our space-time at rest has to be homogeneous, isotropic, and linear to be function. Homogeneous means it all has to be the same. The space here has to be the same as the space over here. Space can't change. It all has to be uh, um, isotropic, which means that if I have a ruler here and it's one foot long, if I move it over here, it's still one foot long. It doesn't get, doesn't get uh, shorter or longer depending on where I put it in the space. Space is the same in every, in every direction. Now, these are just the rules we need to have this, this button-down learning lab physical reality so that we can interact with it consistently. If we didn't have a homogeneous isotropic linear space, then we would have a reality that what I would call funhouse reality. You know, it's like going to a funhouse and you look in a mirror and everything is bent and distorted and weird, and that's the way our reality, our reality would be. Claiming that it is homogeneous, isotropic, and linear means it's like it is. Okay, now if that's the case, then we have to have this 3D pixel has to be a constant. Again, you can't have a ruler one length here and another length someplace else, which it would be on your computer screen. If you had some big pixels and some little pixels, you can imagine a picture that go, would be going across it. It would get distorted. It would be like, the, again, the funhouse mirror. When it would get to the big pixels, suddenly it would grow, you know, because it's defined to be so many pixels high. So you get the big pixels and the little thing and would jump, and then it would get smaller again. So the pixels all have to be the same size. Well, if the pixels are all the same size, that means that this delta V, this little chunk here, they all have to be the same size. Okay, if the frame rate has to be consistent, because if the frame rate weren't consistent, then things would slow up and speed down. Speed down. Slow up, they would speed up and slow down. It would be like turning your, your, your um, VCR to slow and to fast and to high speed and things would be bumpy in time. So delta T has to be a constant. Otherwise, we don't get a space that's like the space that we measure, like the space that we experience. It wouldn't be a good learning space. Well, if delta V is a constant, we take the, that's a volume. You take the cube root of a volume, you get a distance. And you divide that by delta T, you end up with a constant. Because that's constant and that's constant, then the speed of light has to be constant. And why is it constant? Or what does that mean that it's constant? That means that there's a certain maximum speed that you can transfer data from here to here to here to here. There's only so quickly you can do that. You can only move the data from here to here in one delta T. The next delta T, you can move it to here. And the next delta T, you can move it to here. So that is a constant because we live in a virtual reality that has to have a, a uh, isotropic space and has to have continuous time. So because of that, that's why C has to be a constant. So it just comes out of the fact that, that um, we live in a virtual reality. So here again, the virtual reality tells us, of course, C is a constant. Now, you've been following the news, you know there's some experiments at CERN that says that maybe they violated this, that there's something goes faster than light. That doesn't violate what I've just told you here. See, the, the highest velocity that information can move through the reality still has to be a constant. Okay, now what we've measured is that C's the constant. Einstein said no matter can go faster than that. And there's a very, very high probability that what they found with, with uh, neutrinos uh, that they've measured going faster than the speed of light isn't really going faster than the speed of light. There's some other function going on. We, we've seen this before when we had uh, um, entangled particles. You have entangled particles, you flip the spin of this particle and that one flips instantly, even if they're on opposite sides of the universe. 
And they said, oh, well, then that means that information traveled faster than speed of light. It doesn't. These two particles are actually one thing. They're not two things. They're entangled. So it's a different phenomena. So I think we'll find out that the that, uh, speed of light is still the, is still the uh, speed limit in reality.